Thank you. Uh, amen. Well, what I'm going to be doing uh, today um, is teaching a session from our uh, Forerunner School class. Uh, our, the class is called A Theology of the Bride. Uh, and we've, the total class is about 15 sessions, and uh, we've, some of the sessions are two parts. So, you know, it's close to 20 sessions on the bride. And uh, just as we were planning the, the preparation of this class, we had this sensing that, you know, the, 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 the bride of Christ, Christ in the relationship with the bride is such an important topic that we need to really dig deep into that to train uh, forerunners throughout the earth. And, and we're working with uh, a number of forerunners. Uh, we have two different components. We have one, as we call the forerunner school, that we're working with, with believers really around the world. Uh, and then we also are working with the, uh, our life school regional leaders, about uh, 25 of them, where we are, we'll be taking them through this teaching. And so we, we're really going to focus a lot on the, uh, the bride because it's such a, a critical aspect of God's eternal purpose. And, um, uh, and so, you know, this is actually session 11. We're kind of filling in as we go, go along. This is session 11, and it'll, I'll actually teach this in two parts. But uh, we went through a lot of the teachings. We went through the bride in the book of Revelation, the bride in Matthew 22, the bride in Matthew 24 and 25, and just a number of scriptures about the relationship between Christ and his bride. Uh, and, you know, it's important because, you know, as you see, and we've talked about this a lot, that Revelation 19, 7 through 8 and 9 talk about when the bride is made ready, then immediately after that the Lord comes back. And so it's a critical aspect of every believer to understand this bridal theology, uh, but not just to understand it, but just to jump into it and pursue it with all of our heart, with a radical uh, abandonment. So anyway, we talked about all that. And then starting with session uh, nine, we began to look at uh, the bride in uh, type and shadow form in, in terms of the Old Testament types and shadows. So in, in uh, session, uh, excuse me, session 9 and 10, uh, we looked uh, at the bride in the book of Esther. And uh, in this session, we're going to look at the bride in the book of Genesis, the bride in the book of Genesis. And specifically today, uh, we're going to look at the, the story of Adam and Eve and how that depicts some really powerful truths uh, about Christ and, and uh, the bride. I mean, we've, people use it a lot. I mean, there's so many different applications for these first two chapters of, of Genesis. Um, uh, a lot of people use it in terms of establishing marriage, principles for marriage and all that, and it's great for that. Uh, but we want to look at it uh, in the context of Adam being a type and shadow of Christ uh, and Eve being a type and shadow of the individual believers and also the, the corporate church. So there's some really powerful truths in this that uh, as uh, believers we need to understand if we're going to be a, in radical pursuit of that bridal paradigm and our being part of the bride uh, ma uh, made uh, ready. So anyway, let's... Um, let me just start with a, a couple of points just to make sure we understand uh, that Adam is a type of Christ. Uh, the scriptures speak of that. And Eve is a type of the individual believer. Uh, you know, if you look at a couple of New Testament passages um, uh, from Romans after, chapter 5, verse 14, uh, Paul wrote this, Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam until uh, I've got this printed in a small font. Death reigned from Adam until Moses, even those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. He's a type of who was to come. He is a type of Christ. Also from 1 Corinthians 15 45. So it is also written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. That's speaking uh, of Christ. So 
the New Testament is really clear that Adam, uh, as we look at him in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, that Adam is a type and a shadow, a picture, a foreshadowing of Christ. And so as we look at Adam, we can see principles related to the person of Christ that are applicable to our life uh, today. And so also, uh, Eve is a, is a type and a shadow of the bride, is a type and shadow of an individual believer, but in the context of the bride. Uh, you know, if you look at um, Ephesians chapter 5, you know, Genesis chapter 2 uh, quotes, uh, you know, for this cause a man uh, shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You know, we always uh, quote that in weddings whenever we're uh, the father of the bride is going to give away the bride. We always use that scripture verse. Uh, but in, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is talking about the relationship of Christ to his bride. Ephesians 5 and the fact that the bride will be presented in all of her glory uh, to the Lord at the, at the time of his second coming. And in the context of that, as you look at like verse uh, 29, 30, 31, in that, uh, toward the end of that chapter, he quotes uh, Genesis chapter 2 uh, in the context of that being the bride of Christ. Uh, and so I know I'm just laying a foundation here, but I want to make sure we understand that when we look at Adam and Eve, even though there are many applications of that, we're looking at it in the context of Adam being a type and shadow of Christ and Eve being a type and shadow of an individual believer, but in the context of the bride. And so that, that is supported by uh, the New Testament. Um, so let's, I want us to just to read a little bit of the scriptures uh, from Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Uh, I would encourage you to go back and to read uh, all of chapter 1 and all of chapter 2. Uh, you know, I mean, we're all familiar with it, but it's something we probably, uh, I mean, I hadn't uh, until recently, hadn't looked at it very, you know, in quite a while. And so there's some points that we need to make from it. But anyway, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Uh, and so in the beginning God created, speaking of the beginning, uh, then we'll skip down to about verse 25. I, I'm, I'm trying to bring out some of the key verses that we'll be talking about uh, here in this session. Uh, verse 25, God made the beast of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creates on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Uh, I want you to just to remember as we start talking about that, that he created things after their kind. Now, man was created in a sense after his kind in his image. Uh, and so anyway, we'll see that in verse uh, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and, the, uh, and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now we move to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, then the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in, the, in Eden. When he said became a living being, let me just, really that word there, being, is soul. He became a living soul. Uh, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east and in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord caused to grow every tree that is pleasing in the sight and the good for food. And then the two trees that we need to be aware of. 
The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil were there as well. <coughs> now, let's turn to let's go to Genesis 2, verse 15. I'll have just a few more of these, and then we'll start talking about them. Uh, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it, to cultivate and keep the garden. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day uh, that you eat from it you shall surely die. Uh, then verse, starting with verse 18 now. Uh, then the Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. Remember that. It's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. The man gave the names to, to all cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. Now, hear this. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. There was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. That's going to be important here in a few minutes. Then the man said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Uh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Uh, and so I know there was a lot of reading. I know there was a lot of reading. But I wanted to uh, kind of lay the context here so that we can make some points for it uh, out of this context. Um, the first thing that I wanted, I've got like several sections of scripture here, but the first, first thing that I want to, points that I want to make is that, and I've titled this, From the Beginning. Uh, when I was preparing this message, and I'm, I'm ex actually excited about the points that the Lord has shown me in this, but when I first started working on it uh, this week, I'd written it uh, two or three months ago, and so when I was go back to look at it, because I knew I was going to have to teach on it, I thought, man, oh, wow, this is really, really boring. And uh, you're probably saying, well, it still is. But it's, not, it's, not, it's going to get better, I promise you. Uh, um, I said, this is really, really boring. And so I asked, I said, Lord, show me what you want to show me in the story of Adam and Eve. Because I know, I know th there's some powerful truths in this story. I know there are, and, and I, I'm not yet gotten... Uh, even hardly anything out of the depth of what I know is there. So I prayed and I asked, and uh, and I was really amazed at what the, the Lord began to show me. Uh, and this is this is really going to be important to us. And I've titled this section "From the Beginning." From the beginning. But it's interesting that God wrote out in type and shadow form, but he wrote, he, he spoke his entire eternal plan and purpose for mankind from the beginning of scripture. That his eternal purpose, and we'll go into what the plan and purpose is in a few minutes, but from the beginning of, of the scriptures, God spoke and he said, I'm going to reveal the entire plan for all of mankind. He's not random about his eternal purpose. Now, we know from other teachings that God's eternal purpose is that the person of Christ is central, he is preeminent, it is all from him, for him, and through him. It's about the man Christ Jesus. And in his eternal plan, the eternal plan, a, ma a major aspect of that eternal plan is that God in his sovereignty 
has desired a bride for Christ. And that bride for Christ would be uh, in companionship and in partnership with him, not only in this age, like Drew was saying, this life is fleeting. Not only in this age, but throughout eternity that God has raised up an eternal bride, an eternal Eve, if you will, for him. And then he also, uh, this really amazed me as well, he also put in the process by which the bride is made ready. Because Adam was, was uh, uh, created as a living soul where Christ is a life-giving spirit. And that soul has to be transformed. Yes, they were created in the image of God, but they weren't fully into that image yet. And even if, the, even although, although in the, the second chapter of Genesis, the, uh, Christ going to the cross is prophesied even there. So God in his foreknowledge knew that they were going to fall in Genesis chapter 3 and that the cross would be necessary. But even if it had not, Adam and Eve would have had to eat of the tree of life and not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They would have had to deny that. You know, obviously they have to deny eating of the tree of evil, uh, not to participate in evil, but also to deny eating of the tree of good. In other words, doing, doing things for God apart from God. And so, so out of that process, out of that process, uh, the bride it's being made ready. And I, I, and I began to think, wow, God in your sovereignty, it's amazing. It's amazing. He didn't wait until the New Testament to give his eternal plan. You know, Paul got, got revelation of it in Ephes and recorded in Ephesians chapter 1. But it was established before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1 says that. But it's recorded. So the begin, from the beginning of Scripture, God laid out. And we'll, we're going to go into some of the parts of it we'll go in, in a minute. But God laid out his eternal plan for mankind. And that speaks... One thing, and we'll, we'll end with this as well, but it speaks with the importance of us jumping in to participation with that plan. So from the beginning of scriptures, but also from the beginning of time. You know, because, I mean, nobody knows for sure who wrote the book of Genesis, but I guess one of the common uh, uh, themes or approaches is that Moses wrote it, that he wrote the first five books of the Bible. And so that's a good chance that's probably true. But even though he wrote that, this, the, the story, and you know, that was a couple thousand years or maybe after this took place, whatever, we don't know for sure. But this was this was communicated from one generation to another to another for thousands of years until it's re re recorded. You know, some people think, Josephus wrote that Methuselah was kind of like the scribe who wrote out, wrote out or, you know, was the communicator of that. So it was passed from one generation to another. But the point is from the beginning. This is the point. From the beginning of scriptures, but also from the beginning of time. Beginning of scriptures and the, from, from the beginning of time, God laid out his eternal plan for Christ to have a bride as his eternal partner. And I don't know if it's, if it's exciting you, but it sure excited me when I, uh, when I, when I got that revelation. From the beginning. Uh, all right, so let's look, at the, let's look at the plan. I've got eight points about uh, eight aspects that we see here in, in the eternal plan. And 
The first one is that the eternal plan includes, I mean, it's also, the eternal plan is also for the Heavenly Father to have a family of mature sons, the Holy Spirit to have a temple, but for Christ to have a bride, an equally yoked partner who has been made ready, who has taken on his image. Um, so part of the eternal plan, and, and the part we're going to be talking about is the bridal aspect of God's eternal plan, is that Christ was to have a bride. Uh, Genesis 2.18 says it was not good for man to be alone. And even, in the, even though the Godhead was content and lacking in nothing, the fullness of the Trinity, they, they were content and they lacked nothing, but even so, they desired. This is before the foundation of the world and the eternal councils before the foundation of the world. In that, they, uh, they decided that they wanted a family and that for Christ to have an eternal bride, it was not good for man to be alone. And so out of that, they created, in the Genesis account, a bride for Adam, but in our type and shadow form, it was decided that a bride for Christ would be a part of the plan. The second aspect of the eternal plan uh, was that the Christ bride was to take on the image and the nature of Christ, to take on the image and the nature of Christ. That's the plan. Um, you know, it says this in uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, let us create man in our image. Now, the image wasn't in fullness yet because they had to participate with the eating of the tree of life and, uh, you know, ultimately after the fall because the cross was necessary to create the fullness, image in fullness. But the plan from the beginning was for Christ to have a bride who had been conformed into the image of God or the image of Christ. Now, this is, this is important for us to understand because this is part of God's eternal plan from the very beginning. Now, you look at a lot of the church, what's going on around the, the global church, almost everything is being taught or pursued other than making a people take on the image of Christ through the cross. Very, you know, very little of that. You know, there's, the focus is on, uh, you know, I'm seeker making being everything to everybody so that people can come to Christ on gifts and prosperity and all kinds of things along those lines. But very little emphasis is being given uh, globally in the church to what the eternal plan and purpose is from the very beginning. Of course, it's all throughout the scriptures, it's throughout the New Testament as well. But from the very beginning, the plan was for a people, a bride, to be made ready who would take on the image of Christ. And so what does that speak to us? It says, okay, if that's the, if that's the eternal plan from the time of the first man and woman in the earth... We better take it seriously. Amen? Amen. 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 So that's the second part of the eternal plan. The third part of the eternal plan uh, is that the bride is to be Christ's eternal partner. Christ, the bride is to be Christ's eternal partner. Um, you know, it says they were to take dominion over the earth. And we read the scriptures there. We won't go back to those. Take dominion over the earth. The plan is for the bride to be made ready and to then to partner with Christ throughout eternity to take dominion over the creation of God. Now, you don't see this in, in Genesis 2, but we know from other places that in God's eternal plan, the church age is for the, the, the partnership to take dominion over our own life and over the lives of others, individual lives. You know, a lot of the, the um, 
Seven Mountain Dominion theology is that we're supposed to take dominion over the earth in this age, and they get some of that from Genesis. But that's really the kingdom age. The age now is to for us to take dominion for, by, led by the Holy Spirit, the, the eternal indwelling Christ, to take dominion over our own soul, to take dominion over our own actions. But then, th that does, but the eternal plan of God doesn't stop there because in the kingdom age to come, this partnership will continue and Christ and his bride, the prepared bride, will take dominion together over the earth where Christ will be ruling from Jerusalem. Uh, from his throne there. But it doesn't even end then, even though, you know, that's a thousand years uh, af after he returns. Then there's the, there's the eternal ages where age after age after age, it says that in Ephesians, eternal ages, this partnership will continue. Will Christ and his bride will be taking authority and dominion together to make Christ preeminent, preeminent throughout the whatever, the universe, the, the creation, whatever it is, I don't know, but, it would, but whatever it is, I know one thing, I want to be a part of it. Amen? Amen. But it starts now. The fact that God laid this out at the beginning of time, to me, just... Like, you know, like Brian was talking about the judgment seat of Christ and how weighty that is, and, and I agree. But this was like weighty to me too. Wow, it showed me this is important. Jumping into this plan is important. It's not something we take lightly. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, that's the plan. Now, there's another aspect of that. It, it's, there is the close, there's a close and intimate relationship that is part of God's eternal plan. It's not just to have a bride who will partner with him. It's not just to have a group of people that will take on their image and be distant from them or, or just some partnership that's kind of like a ministry connection. I mean, those of us that have been in uh, in any kind of full-time ministry, know that there are different levels of connection with other ministers. Some you kind of have a relationship with, but it's just strictly ministry. And others you have not only that, but you have a, you, you have a close friendship with that person. Uh, and the ones with a friendship are, are better uh, than just the ministry, even though the, the ministry can be productive. But it's not, it's, it's not like that with Christ and, and his bride. It's not just like, okay, we're going to work together to establish Christ as king over the universe. Yes, we are going to do that, but it's a lot more than that. It's, it's a close, intimate uh, relationship uh, w w with them. So this brings up the fourth point of the eight on, on terms of the plan. The bride is to have and provide companionship to Christ. Uh, there were more than just two people joined together for a purpose. There was a friendship and a fellowship. It was not good for man to be alone. You know, I was thinking about this. Um, Brian and I were in Africa a number of years ago, but we were in West Africa with uh, one of the life school leaders, and somehow we started talking about marriage, and we were talking about Adam and Eve and all that in the context of marriage. And he said, you know, it's not good to, to really show a whole lot of love to your wife. Because if you do, you know, if you do, they get kind of bossy, controlling. <laughs> and he's serious, he was serious. Uh, and so Brian and I were like, Okay, I don't think you got this quite right. <laughs> you know? And so we began to talk to him about, no, you need to show love. You know, you have, you're, it needs to be a companionship. It needs to be, you know, it needs to be a friendship, a closeness, and a love relationship between husband and wife. And so, uh, anyway, he heeded our, uh, our advice. And he, you know, he was, we were together, he was away from his home 
with us. Uh, and so he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy her a fish, a certain, a certain type of fish. I mean, nothing says love better than buying your wife a fish, right? <laughs> Uh, so anyway, she liked it, though. He gave us the report afterwards. She liked it, and we saw him a year or two later, and she was beaming, you know, because she was so thankful that we had spoken to him and he changed the way he viewed that relationship. But it's that way with us in Christ. You, you know, he's not just wanting us to be a, a doormat, you know, just to work for him. He wants a relationship, a love relationship with a partner, you know, a partnership, a love partnership. You know, when, when, you know how the bride was formed from Genesis chapter 2, put Adam into a deep sleep and then took a, cut, uh, cut into his side and took a rib uh, out of his side. And, and Eve was formed out of that rib on the side. But that's, that's we'll talk about that some more in a minute, but that's, that's the cross. Christ was pierced out of the side and the bride came forth from his side, not from his feet, but his, but his side, a partner, a partner. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's, to be, it's to be companionship. And the fifth point, which, was, which would be um, a part of, again, the intimate relationship is that Christ and his bride are to come into full union with each other as, as one. You know, Genesis chapter 2, 23, 24, 25 says, you know, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave uh, to, to his wife, to be joined uh, to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You know, when, when I, I do or did do, marriage, pre-marriage counseling, I always talk about, you know, I always talk about the, that, the, the fullness of what that means in terms of a husband and a wife. It's not just the physical union of one flesh, but it's also the spiritual and the, and the soulish union. Uh, you know, for a marriage to be uh, really fully what God wants and, and fulfilling to both parties, there needs to be that union uh, that is not only the physical union, but also the, the spiritual union. I mean, if there's not that spiritual union, there's only so far that a marriage can, can go. And I know that's not always... That's not always the case with, with a, a lot of Christian marriages. And so we need to pray for that, uh, that that could come into. But that's the ultimate uh, of it. And then the soulish union that, uh, you know, you come together, not soulish, but in our soul, you know, our mind, our will, and our emotions. Now, we're, I mean, I, I just started thinking, okay, that's, Don and I do not think alike. So I don't know about the, my, I guess it was in the, I mean, if I say, if I think something should be left, she thinks it should be right. I don't know. Any, any other husbands and wives deal with that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I guess that's good. You know, opposites attract and, and uh, complement each other. Uh, so we're still working on that part of it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but she is the, the, the suitable helpmate for me. I mean, really she is. She's a, a blessing to me. But anyway, I won't go into more any more of that before I get in trouble. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians 6.15 uh, says that you know you are one, your spirit is one with Christ. And so the moment we're born again, our spirit becomes one. And Brian's talked a lot about that in a lot more detail than I'm, I can get into. But, but our spirit is now becomes one. It's almost like it's glued together with Christ. That's part of that meaning of that word. Now the goal is for us, our mind to be conformed to the image of Christ, our emotions to be uh, taken under his lordship, our will to become his will. 
uh, you know, our actions and our cravings to become his and his alone. Uh, so the goal of this eternal plan is for Christ as the bridegroom and the, us as an individual believer that's his bride to become one. Yes, there's companionship, but it's even more than that. It's to become one. One in thought, one in plan. Full union. And then the sixth point is that Christ and his bride are to have an intimate love relationship. An intimate love relationship. Drew is so good in prophesying my points for my message uh, and Brian's message almost every week. He's uh, really good at that. Uh, but we're to, we're to have this intimate love relationship with Christ. Uh, I love this quote from Frank Viola. He, he wrote a book uh, called From Eternity to Here. It's about God's eternal purpose. And uh, he wrote this. God is perfectly adequate within himself but because God is love, he is not content to be adequate in himself. For this reason, God the Son wanted someone upon, upon whom to pour out the love that coursed from his being, which is the very same love that the Father poured out upon him. Again, the Son's desire for a counterpart was not rooted in any deficiency within himself. It was instead in, rooted in in the overflowing excess of God's divine love. God was motivated by his love for, for, for creation, to create a bride, an eternal plant partner for Christ. And it's really true. I mean, I know sometimes, I don't know if you struggle with this, but so there, there are times when I, when I think, does God really love me? Anybody else struggle with that from time to time? Yeah, yeah. Does God really love me? You know, I see my weaknesses and my frailties and sin and all the things that I would like to get victory over, and it, sometimes you think, does God really, does he really love me? Yeah, you know, when I'm doing good, I think he does, but sometimes I'm doing, not doing so good, he doesn't think I am. I don't think he does. But he does. God's love is rooted in him, not in my, who I am. It's rooted in him. Before the fall, God's love, but he created Eve. He created a bride for him because of his love for man and woman and to have a partner. It was not good for Christ to be alone, and there was love there. And that leads us that, you know, that there, it's so important that as the bride, Eve had, Eve had to love Adam, and she did. You know, it was interesting, when Eve was created, this is an important point, when Eve was created, there was no other person in the world other than Adam. Her love was totally devoted to, to Adam. And now, that's the way our love for Christ should be. As though there is no other, well, I don't want to say there's no other because we are to love other people. We are to love our spouse. We are to love, uh, you know, others. But our love for Christ needs to be, and, and, and you know, Luke talks about this. Our love for Christ needs to be so strong and so powerful and so overwhelming that any other love is almost like it's not really love, even though we are to love others. So it's a love relationship. You know, the Lord spoke, this, this is not really for this series, but uh, the Lord spoke this to me, I guess prophetically, uh, for what's coming in the days ahead. And it, from, from the, the book Song of Songs, 
and you know, the Song of Songs starts out with the bride, the maiden saying, your love is better than wine. Now, speaking to interpreting that, I think what she's saying is that your love is better than any worldly pleasure. Your love is better than any worldly pleasure. But Song of Solomon ends with, in chapter, well, not the end, but it, toward the end, uh, Song of Solomon 8 6. A love so strong that many waters cannot quench it. And here's what the Lord, here's what the Lord was saying to me, but it's not just to me, it's for all of us, that we're moving into days ahead. I don't know whether. I don't know how soon, probably fairly soon, where our love has to be more, has to be stronger than just worldly pleasures. It has to be a love that many waters cannot quench. Pressures, persecution, whatever might be coming, judgments, whatever might be coming upon the earth. And the prophets have spoken a lot about this, and what the Lord is saying is that you need to allow me to do a deep work in you so that your love for Christ, for the, your bridegroom, becomes a lot stronger than just better than the worldly pleasures. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I'm talking about good worldly pleasures, not sinful stuff. But, I mean, there's certain, there's certain worldly pleasures that we really enjoy, that we can enjoy. And there are different things for different people. But let's just, we'll just use a, a Braves baseball game or something. I enjoy watching the Braves play baseball. That's a worldly pleasure. I enjoy it. I, I, love may be a too strong a word, but I enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy seeing Georgia Tech beat Georgia. It hadn't happened in a while, but I do love that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, now, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to go any further with this. Uh, but that kind of love is not sufficient for what's coming. Uh, our love must be to the point that many, many, many water, men, not many M I N I, is that, uh, but many M A N Y waters cannot quench it. So we need to, that's an important point, I think, because, I, you know, I don't think, I think we're heading into territory that we've never in our lifetime ever been in. And our love needs to grow. Uh, every, that's for every one of us to do. Okay. Um, okay, I've only got two more of these points and then, then a little bit more. Uh, an eternal purpose, um, Okay, that's the that's the the relationship aspect of it. Now we're still part of the talking about the plan. Uh, the seventh point, and it's still part of the plan. Uh, there there is an eternal purpose from their plan, the, the, an eternal purpose in their partnership. There's an eternal purpose uh, in their partnership, and we've really talked about that. So I'm not going to spend much time in that, but it does. It does talk in the in the book of Genesis about the eternal partnership between Christ, I mean Adam and Eve, and in this case, in type and shadow form, in Christ uh, and His bride. And then the final point in the plan is that a glorious bride will be presented pre presented to Christ at His second coming. You know, if you look at there, that you know it was not good for Adam to be alone. So what did God do? He put Adam into a deep sleep uh, and he took a rib from his side and, and he, at Eve was formed out of that rib from his side. You know, and when we talk about the cross, you know, Jesus was pierced on the side and I, you know, I didn't have him go back to look at this, but the blood and water flowed from his side, which I think is a picture of the, the blood of Christ. The bride was formed 
through the blood of Christ. It's part of the new covenant. We've talked about that in other sessions. The new covenant is, is at least in part a bridal covenant. Uh, and the water being a picture of the Holy Spirit to transform her. But she's pres then Eve was brought to Adam. Now she was that without sin. She was beautiful. She was magnificent. She was full of glory. Uh, you know, and Adam said after that, you know, she's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So she was that glorious bride. It shows the, the picture at the, at the second coming, the Christ the, it, 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 it typified by Eve in all her glory is brought to, to uh, him, to, to Adam and to Christ in all of her glory. So there's some beautiful, beautiful symbolism and importance I think, and I want to just move now. Uh, no, no, I'm going to skip the point. We want to move to, we want to talk a little bit about the process of readiness. You know, Adam was created. So the whole, there, the, even back from the beginning, there was, a, there was a process of the bride having to be made ready. So it's not just something that happened after the fall as part of God's eternal plan. Now, the fall created a different approach to this, which is the cross, but the principle is, is the same because Adam was, was created as a living soul, uh, and he still had to have transformation to become full into the full image of God. I mean, that's why the two trees were there, because they were challenged, even if there had not been a fall, they were challenged to eat from the tree of life, but to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, God, I believe, uh, for, foresaw in his foreknowledge, saw the fall and knew that there would be a need for the cross because Adam was put into a deep sleep, uh, and that's the cross, him going, dying on the cross, and being resurrected with a bride coming forth from his side. Uh, but so, you know, that's where the, the New Testament principles show, come forth, where, you know, Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. And then, of course, Paul deals with a lot of that too, which we've been dealing with in the Indwelling Life class. But the point, from the very beginning, there's a process uh, that was laid out even before the fall of making ourselves ready to be the eternal wife of Christ. And so all of that speaks of the importance of us jumping in wholeheartedly into this process of making ourselves ready. We've been invited from the very beginning of time. Every believer who's ever lived and ever will live in this age has been and is being invited into this bridal paradigm. And it's absolutely important that we say yes to it. And not just take it as automatic. It's not automatic. There's a process there's a process of readiness that's needed. And we have to say yes, not only to the invitation to be the bride, every one of us would say yes to that. But not every one of us, uh, quite possibly, would say yes to the process of dying a complete death to our old man so that we can be made ready uh, as his bride. You know, there's... There's, there's really serious consequences and importance here. One, it's been from the beginning of creation, God's, that speaks of God's absolute importance of this to God and therefore to us. You know, we see how the enemy in this, in chapter three especially, how the enemy opposes and resists the bridal relationship with Christ. 
the enemy tried to seduce and did seduce Adam and Eve uh, to eat of the, uh, of the tree of, of knowledge and good and evil. And so as, as they did that, uh, you know, they fell. Uh, and so you see the, the opposition of the enemy against this bridal preparation shows of the importance of it. We've got to look at the consequences of it. That's the third part of this. The, the consequences. Ever since the beginning, the fall has created a whole different paradigm uh, of how to make ourselves ready. So the consequences, and I believe there, there, there are very serious consequences to every, um, every believer who chooses not to make themselves ready. Uh, this is my interpretation. Man. Brian talked about it uh, this morning about the, we're all going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give it an account uh, of our life. Um, you know, when you think, okay, the bride is going to be the eternal partner, the eternal companion. the eternal wife of the Lamb. You know, eternity is a long time. Uh, in fact, it never ends. You know, I, I, I recall Francis Chan, uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with him, but he did a message, I forgot where it was, but I saw his message, and he had a, a long, long rope that stretched all the way across the stage and he had about this much of it in covered colored black and the rest of it was white and he said this black part which is just a short short piece of it that's our life on earth and the long piece is eternity and he says most people live for this little, for the best life in this little black section Whereas what we need to be doing is living in for this long piece uh, of the white, eternity. Uh, and that doesn't mean we can't have fun. Obviously we can and we should. God wants us to enjoy this life. But at the same time, while we're doing that, the more importantly is to be about making ourselves ready as his bride. So Adam and Eve really is an important, uh, it's an important teaching because it shows some principles that really, for one thing, are kind of consolidated into two short chapters, but maybe highlighted in a way that aren't highlighted in other places in the scriptures. And so anyway, I want to pray for us. I want to pray that I've got a couple of things in my heart, but the main thing I want to do is I want to pray that if we haven't said yes to jumping into the bridal process, preparation process, that God would speak to us and empower us for that. So let's just stand up and let's do that. Father, I know as I've studied this, and I know when you study something, you always get more out of it than those who listen to you, to you talk about it. But as I've studied this, it's really shown me the importance of really paying close attention to this bridal paradigm and the eternal nature of it. How you, before time, before the fall laid out a plan for mankind. The same plan that Christ spoke of when he walked the earth, the same plan when Paul uh, spoke about and when he wrote the epistles that he wrote. It's so important. Help us to be made ready, Lord. Help us to say yes. Help us to be made ready. We pray. And just, if you, if you agree, just say yes. Just say yes. Yes, Lord. Yeah, yeah, we want to do this. We want to be ready.
while we're in this m mode of the presence of the Lord, you know, Genesis 2.25 said that they were naked and they were not ashamed. And I think it speaks of two points that, that I want to, uh, well, one, we want to offer ministry for. The, 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 the first aspect is a transparent relationship with Christ. The nakedness speaks of transparency with Christ. You know, and maybe all of us, probably all of us are that way with him, but we be transparent with him. That we don't withhold anything from him. Doesn't mean that we have to be perfect, uh, but that in those areas of imper imperfection, we share with him in, in, in a transparent nature. Because out of that, with a, with a cry in our heart, for the indwelling Christ, the Holy Spirit, to transform us in those areas. A transparency. That's just something we all need to do. I'm not, I'm not calling for a ministry uh, altar call for that. But I, do, I did feel, as I was preparing for this, that there might be some, maybe all, where there's shame, where you're ashamed and there's shame in you. They were naked and not ashamed. They were, they were shame and torment. You know, I've started to think this certainly would be me and, uh, and probably most of us in the room. There's a lot of, you know, we all have a history before Christ. Maybe not everybody has a history before Christ. I mean, I think Donna did he steal a cookie out of the cookie jar one night. But for most of us, you know, I didn't actually come to Christ till I was 30 years old, and there's a lot of history there before that. But that history before Christ can lead us, easily lead us to, you know, feeling shame where we can't seem to quite get the past in the past uh, and even torment of the enemy. Can I ever make myself ready? Look what I did. Not that you know in your mind that you've been forgiven. Probably everybody in the room knows in their mind they've been forgiven. But their heart, sometimes you think, oh, I'm so ashamed of things in my past and the, and the past torments me. I really believe that God is saying that today if there's anybody like that, we're, and we're not going to ask you any details about what, why you're up here, but I really believe God is going to, can, will, not can, will break off that shame and condemnation and torment from things in your past. And maybe I've missed it and there's no one who feels that, but I think if there is somebody there, uh, and I want to say this. I want to, I, one reason that I said that most everybody here uh, has a history, because probably that's true for most part. Uh, and it's certainly true with me. But I don't want you to feel shameful, ashamed to come forward for ministry if you have shame, if you understand what I'm saying. Because I really believe God will, will do something today. Uh, there's been enough warfare this week that I'm sure he must want to do something. So, <laughs> so. Would you pray that for those online and then in the online portion for the ministry? Oh, okay, okay. All right. So, so those listening online that have that same thing. Yeah. So those are those that have it. We'll pray first for those that have it online, of uh, that are watching online that have this issue. We pray, Father. We know that Jesus uh, cast out a demon even from a distance. And we know even uh, through the internet lines or whatever, you are able to set people free. So we ask for a work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I feel the anointing of the Lord on this, that you would do a deep work. Yes. Deep work. Set them free, Lord. Set them free from all shame yes. and all torment related to the past. Yes. For the blood of Jesus is sufficient. We declare that the blood of Jesus is sufficient. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
And so we're going to end the online. But it, for those that are here, if you have, if this is you, don't be ashamed to come forward because we